um, YouTube. Good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted that we're here to begin our study of Introduction to Talmud. Um, I'm going to uh, invite us to offer two blessings to begin. Um, because of the limitations of the Zoom format, we need to keep the congregation, that is to say you, muted while I have the microphone so that we're not speaking all on top of each other. Um, as is my kind of preferred learning and teaching style, I'll teach a segment and then pause periodically for group reflection, comments, and questions. If you have a comment or question and you would like to be acknowledged before I've paused in my often uh, dis discursive manner of presenting, please don't hesitate to raise a digital hand. Uh, either by raising your actual hand on the new Zoom client and letting it acknowledge your hand that way. See, my hand just went up. Or you can uh, just use the reactions interface on your Zoom uh, window to uh, raise a hand and I'll acknowledge you that way. Or if you just are trying to get my attention and can't get it, you can also just pipe up by unmuting yourself and I'll try to do my best to acknowledge you in turn. And if you would like to use the chat interface, either to message me privately or to message the group with a question, an insight, a comment, by all means, that's part of what makes this format fun and exciting for us to, to learn together. Um, if this is our first time studying together, a very heartfelt uh, welcome and gratitude for your bravery and interest in uh, learning Talmud, um, which is without a doubt the most rewarding and challenging of all sacred Jewish literature to uh, explore and unpack. Um, I'm going to do my best to emphasize the rewards, um, but I can't do that without inviting us to steel ourselves for the challenges. Um, I spent a ton of time over the last few weeks trying to figure out how to teach this class. Um, the, the bad news is I haven't figured it out yet. Um, I have some ideas about how I want to approach this, but even as of a half hour ago, I hadn't decided which text we were going to learn this morning. Obviously, by now, I had to, I had to just make a decision, um, and I'll say more about that. But, but first, I'd like to say a few words about what we're going to be studying. What is this literature known as Talmud? Talmud is one of many uh, Hebrew terms that means learning. It comes from the Hebrew root, lamed mem dalet, lamad, or as it is sometimes uh, conjugated, lomed, which means uh, study or to learn. Um, a pupil or student in Hebrew is a talmid. And talmud is one of several words in the Jewish language or Jewish languages that mean to learn. Mishnah is another word that means learning. Um, coming from a word that you may be familiar with from the Hebrew Bible, from the Shema prayer, Vishinantam, Vishinantam Levanecha Vidibar Tabam, we recite every time we chant Ve'ahavta, which is part of the Shema paragraph, you shall teach them faithfully to your children, speak of them in your home and on your way when you lie down and when you rise up. Um, there are other words that mean learning in Jewish tradition, and we will undoubtedly encounter them in time. Um, the Talmud represents accumulated wisdom of groups of scholars known variously as rabbi or some of the other derivative forms of this ancient word rabbi, rabbi in Hebrew, which means teacher. Um, in the Aramaic language and from the Babylonian community of scholars, the title of such a teacher was not rabbi, rabbi, but rav. So you have a group of teachers from uh, Eretz Yisrael, from the land of Israel, who go by the honorific title rabbi, which means teacher or my teacher. And you have a, a completely analogous group of scholar teachers from the Babylonian Jewish community um, known as Rav, and then occasionally you get additional honorifics that are also related like Rabban, um, uh, Rabba, and all of these are various conjugate forms of the same root word that designates an honorary title for a teacher of Jewish tradition. Um, the Talmud represents approximately seven centuries of accumulated 
rabbinic teaching. It is generally divided up into three strata or segments that can be understood in their chronological order of composition. So um, going all the way back to earliest recorded Jewish wisdom, we must understand that the, the core literature of the Israelite community, which of course is the uh, original people that gave what will become Jewish literature to the world, is Tanakh, which is sometimes called the Jewish Bible, other times called the Hebrew Bible, or just in our communities, we can call it the Bible, and what is meant is Tanakh the composite or anthology of three major collections of literature. Torah, which are the first five books of the document, um, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh are Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, sometimes called the five books of Moses, sometimes called the Pentateuch, which is Greek for five books, sometimes called a Chumash, which is when you have the Torah in book form in the pews of your shul, that is a chumash, um, chumash from the Hebrew word chamesh, five. So the, the five, the big five is Torah. This is followed in sequence by many books which are compiled under the general heading nivi'im, which means the prophets. And those include both the literary prophets, like the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the minor prophets, Amos, uh, Hosea, Obadiah, Zedekiah, Malachi, and many more. And other books that are considered part of the prophets, which are more narrative in form and style, such as the books of Joshua, Judges, and Kings. Um, and then finally, the Tanakh includes a collection of writings called the writings, Kituvim or Chituvim, it's the Chit of Tanakh. Um, and those include familiar scrolls like the scroll of Esther, Megillat Esther, or the Song of Songs, the great love poem of the Hebrew Bible, or um, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and Chronicles and um, a whole bunch of others. So Ecclesiastes or Kohelet. So put, to, put it together, you got Torah, Nivi'im or prophets, Kituvim or writings, and you have Tanakh, which is an acronym if you haven't figured that out. Um, this is codified as the core of Jewish sacred literature by, let us say, the second century of, the, of before the Common Era, BCE, which is the Jewish way of saying BC. Our Christian friends say before Christ, Jewish people and others say before the common era, we all mean the same thing. It means before we started counting the year zero, as in today is January 12th, 2023, 2023 CE of the common era, or what our Christian, Christian friends call the Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, their Lord. Um, so we are... Now going to um, explore literature or literatures that were composed um, after the Tanakh had become codified and canonized and promulgated in what is more or less its finished form. I, I would have to put an asterisk next to that sentence if I were writing it because you will find throughout Jewish sacred literature, even literature as quote unquote recent as the Talmud, that there are occasional references to scriptural lines, lines from the Tanakh, that actually are not word for word what we have today. There might be even a letter or two different, which only goes to show you that variations in the text may have persisted for many centuries into the common era, and did in fact persist. And generally the view is accepted that the Tanakh as we have it today, Torah writings, pro Torah prophets writings, was not really finalized letter by letter, vowel for vowel, trope mark, meaning cantillation notation for cantillation notation, until the 800s by a group of biblical scholars known as the Masoretes, um, who uh, give us what is conventionally called the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is considered the authoritative, definitive, only accepted official version of the Hebrew Bible. 
Um, so, and they also gave to us the tradition of cantillation, which is not just musical notation, it's actually the way of both vocalizing and punctuating uh, the text, giving it its syntax, its grammar in its finished form. Um, so more on that, if you have questions, you can ask, but I'm giving you a lot of background before we can talk about Talmud. Um, after the Tanakh was finalized, it became almost within, you know, a single generation, a subject of inquiry, study, exegesis, and teaching by early communities of Jewish teachers. We are still talking about the era before the year zero, BCE. And before the year zero, these teachers are given um, a kind of primacy of place in the Talmud itself, but they are not referred to as rabbi. The term rabbi seems not to have emerged in Jewish literature, or Jewish uh, colloquial parlance until sometime in the first century of the common era. It is therefore not surprising that the gospel traditions about Jesus in what Christians call the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, refer to Jesus with some frequency uh, as rabbi, because Jesus is contemporaneous with other figures from the Jewish tradition who are also called rabbi. I do not dispute the claim, by the way, that Jesus was a rabbi, meaning an early teacher of the tradition. Um, the Talmud will actually deal with Jesus, as, and in the view of the Talmud, he is a problematic figure, um, but we probably won't be tackling much of that unless we do. Um, so um, the early communities of both pre-rabbinic teachers who are also identified with a class of Jewish leaders known as the Perushim, which I would say means the explainers or the, um, I don't know how you make a noun out of, uh, out of the act of exegesis, but people who perform exegesis are perushim um, in the Jewish tradition, exponents of the tradition or extrapolators of the tradition. Um, we know them in English as the Pharisees. And I would ask you if you have any kind of mental associations with Pharisees as bad guys, you need to put that away because that characterization comes to us through the Christian scripture from the what Christians call the New Testament, that the Pharisees are viewed as in opposition to the ministry of Jesus and Jesus's uh, followers. But um, so far as Jewish people are concerned, the Pharisees are actually the class of Jewish leaders and scholars whose um, unique methods of interpreting the biblical text directly give rise to the rabbinic modes of scholarship, teaching, and writing. By the time you get into the common era, you see a systematic effort emerge to preserve rabbinic teaching. This was undoubtedly facilitated and catalyzed by the increasing hostility between the Roman Empire, which basically had turned the Judean province, that is to say where the Jews were then living in what is then called Judea, um, ancient Israel having been con conquered and decimated many times over by other empires in the pre-Jesus uh, era, in the BCE era. That increasing hostility between the Jews and the Romans erupting in a major revolt in the late 60s CE um, that results in the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Romans and eventually the crushing of the Jewish resistance at their last outpost in Masada just a few years later. Um, some of this may well be familiar Jewish history to you. In response to these massive catastrophes, a community of scholars and at this point called rabbis, emerges dedicated to preserving the teachings of their faith and their tradition. Um, first in the seaside city of Yavne, close to what is today Tel Aviv, and later in and around the Galilee before spreading throughout the Mediterranean world and, uh, and establishing a satellite community uh, in Babylonia. I shouldn't say establishing. There had been a Jewish community established in Babylonia, which is ancient Mesopotamia or modern-day Iraq, since the 7th century BCE, 
um, uh, the 6th century BCE, when Jews from Judea were exiled to Babylonia after the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem in the south in Eretz Yisrael. Um, so you have these rabbinic um, colonies, I would call them rabbinic civilizations, popping up, whose chief religious task, um, chief community task, was the preservation of rabbinic teaching um, based in part on the Tanakh, but really expressing its own worldview about what it means to be Jewish, how and why. The first great such effort is compiled in a work of literature known as Mishnah. Now, much of this should be familiar to you um, because many of you have been studying Mishnah with me for a long time. Um, Mishnah, as I've taught you, means teaching. Um, it is a, a Hebrew word from the root word shin, which actually means the tooth. Uh, so if you've ever had impressions made at the dentist's office, you bite down into this goo. Nowadays, by the way, they do digital impressions. It's really cool. They can do like a 3D scan using cameras and other sophisticated high-tech equipment. But you used to have to bite down into this green or pink goo, and it would harden into a mold. So they would call that, we're going to take impressions. Right, so same idea. The kind of teaching that the Mishnah is intended to convey is the kind that bites down and makes an impression that lasts. And it was intended to present kind of a topical or a topicalized array of all matters pertaining to how to live a Jewish life. It is sometimes mistakenly, or I would say more accurately, reductively identified as a law code, but the Mishnah is not a code of laws so much as it is a record of Jewish discussion around what the rabbis wanted to codify as normative Jewish practice. It is multivocal, meaning multiple opinions are recorded, many of which provide debates that are not actually resolved with a legal um, uh, point of view that holds sway. So majority and minority opinions or two competing opinions can be recorded in the same Mishnah with no final word around which opinion is the prevailing opinion on what you do as a Jew. Um, nevertheless, the Mishnah becomes what I call the building block of Jewish life. And if you look on our YouTube channel, you will see that the formal name for the course of study that I taught over the last couple of years was Mishnah, the building blocks of Jewish life. The Mishnah was completed, put into its final redacted compiled form, under the direction of the most famous rabbi of the Mishnaic period, Judah Hanasi, or Judah the Prince, um, Yehuda Hanasi, sometimes called just rabbi. Yes, that's how significant this guy was in his own day. And for posterity, you can just say, oh, rabbi compiled the Mishnah. And nobody, you would look like a fool if you asked in the yeshiva, what rabbi? Rabbi in the Mishnah is always Judah Hanasi. The late second century, early third century sage, whose work in compiling the Mishnah um, is monumental. Um, it provides us with six different orders of study, um, which identify, again, topically arranged ways to approach how to live a Jewish life. I'm almost done with my opening preamble, and I appreciate your patience. And then we'll take comments, questions, then we'll say a couple blessings, which I meant to do right up front and then for promptly forgot. Um, almost as soon as the Mishnah was completed, meaning within a generation of the completion of the Mishnah, say, between the years 230 of the Common Era and 260 of the Common Era, a new class of scholars arises whose chief task seems to be their dedication to teaching, expounding, elaborating, and clarifying the Mishnah. Right, so if Mishnah is intended to clarify all matters of Jewish life and practice, it is not. It is not a commentary on the Hebrew Bible, but it often uses the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, as its means of proving or proof texting the points it wishes to make. The, the Mishnah, however, became its own kind of germ cell or seed of later Jewish study and teaching. These first teachers in the post-Mishnaic era are known as the Amoraim, which means the discussers or interpreters from the Hebrew root Amar. The Amoraim build on the work 
of the teachers of the Mishnah who collectively will come to be known as the Tanaim. Tana is actually the Aramaic translation of Mishnah. It's the same word. The, the, the letters get transposed, but Tana means the same thing as Mishnah. It means to teach. But it means to teach in a particular way, and it is often referred to as the teaching by way of reciting. So sometimes the Tanaim, which is synonymous with the Mishnaic teachers, are called the reciters. This is linked to the scholarly consensus that the Mishnah was conveyed chiefly through oral teaching. Most uh, students of this literature, although they may have been literate and able to read, were not actually looking at written text so much as they may have been assembled in classrooms or study halls, listening to a master reciter recite from memory the Mishnah, the rabbinic teachings. Um, this method of teaching uh, leads scholars to conclude that a class of memorizers was developed for the express purpose of reciting Mishnah, the Tanaim. I'm going to get things really confusing now. The Mishnah is not the only anthology of literature that collects the recitings of the Tanaim. There are two others that you need to know. One is a group of, uh, sorry, my, my thumb just went up on the digital screen. Um, one is called the Tosefta, which means the addition from the Hebrew word uh, lihosif, which means to add on. The, the name Joseph, by the way, is from the same root, Tosefta. Tosefta is an Aramaic form of the Hebrew word that means the additional compilation. There are many references to Tosefta, and Tosefta has actually been compiled separately. Yes, you can go to a Jewish library and ask for the volumes of the Tosefta and read it, but it is not considered a core work of Jewish study. Rather, one encounters references to Tosefta in the course of studying Mishnah and Talmud. But it's important to know that it's out there. Contemporaneous with the Mishnah is sort of like all the appendices, we could think of them as the Tosefta is the additional volumes of Tanaitic teaching, early reciters' recitings. And then finally, there is a Mishnaic era collection of teaching known as the Baraita. And Baraita, I actually need to look up what the word means. Baraita is also usually translated as extra Mishnaic teaching. It is contemporaneous with the Mishnah, but for reasons that are not fully understood, it was never redacted into the Mishnah itself. So you might think of it as all the remaining teachings that were left on the cutting room floor, and yet some rabbis clearly dedicated themselves to preserving them, because the Talmud will make many, many, many references to the Baraita literatures. Okay. So what is this thing called Talmud? Talmud is a confusing term because it refers, you can use it in two ways. One, it may refer to the combined, redacted, finalized product that begins with the Mishnah, then includes, say, three or so centuries of the discussions of the Amoraim, the discussers or interpreters, the, the generations of rabbis and scholars who dedicated themselves to teaching and studying the Mishnah and extrapolating it. I would say exploding it because a single line of Mishnah can lead to pages and pages and pages of Amoraitic discussion. And finally, after two or three centuries of Mishnaic teaching, the Tanaim, the early reciters, followed by three or so centuries of Amoraim, the discussers, you finally have a stratum of Talmudic writing provided by a group of scholars known only to us as the Savoraim, which is sort of like the explainers. They, unlike their pre predecessors, remain anonymous to us. They are not given a name. And it seems that for a couple of hundred years, there was a concerted rabbinic program or effort to smooth out the kinks in the Talmudic literature, to make it more elegant, more internally consistent, 
more uh, logically uh, parsable. So you've got the Tanaim, or what we call the Mishnah, plus extra Mishnaic teachings compiled in the Tosefta, or variously referred to as Baraita, all of that early material. Then you've got three centuries of Amoraim, the discussers or interpreters. And then finally, you have the Savoraim, who try and iron out the kinks and present us with a comprehensive whole. All of this by, let us say, the year 700 or 800 of the Common Era. When we talk about Talmud, we may be talking about that. Or Talmud can also refer only to the dialogue of the Amoraim on the Mishnah itself. So Talmud is either Mishnah plus the later stuff, which in Aramaic gets known as Gemara, which literally means the completion. The logical conclusion of the Mishnah is the Gemara. You can say in common parlance with other fellow students of Talmud, let's study some Gemara today. And that person will know that you mean we're going to study Talmud. You can also say, let's study Talmud. If you say, however, I'm going to study some Mishnah with you, that does not include the Gemara. I have a lot more to say about this, but I really, I recognize that in a half hour of talking, I could have overwhelmed you already. Um, if you would like to know more about this, I highly commend to you two books, which are, I promise you, readable, indeed, much more readable than the Talmud is. You can read them without a rabbi holding your hand. A Talmud, you should never read without a rabbi holding your hand. And I, by the way, I speak for myself. A rabbi or another learned Jew who knows Talmud. Talmud is not meant to be studied in isolation. Um, so when I study Talmud, I always study in chavruta, which means pairing or partnership. The first book, which must be on everyone's shelf, is called Back to the Sources edited by Barry W. Holtz. Um, this is a must-have in every Jewish home book that explains how to read the classic sources of Jewish literature, widely available through your local bookseller or, dare I say it, on Amazon. Um, great book. And in specific, I would commend to anyone who is interested in learning more, this is not required reading, it's merely recommended, the essay by Robert Goldenberg called Talmud. Um, it begins on page 129, and it's about 45 or 50 pages. Uh, I read it in about two hours. It's not hard. Um, it, it Well, it is hard, <laughs> but it's worthwhile. Um, the other book, very readable, lovely, elegant book, is called The Essential Talmud by the great late Adin Steinsaltz, who died a couple years ago, I think in 2020 who was without a doubt the greatest scholar of Talmud in our lifetimes. Whether you are 85 or 25, Adin Steinsaltz was the greatest Talmud scholar of our generation. Indeed, possibly the greatest Talmud scholar of the last century, 200 years, maybe even the last thousand years. An extraordinary mind and a synthesizer of Jewish wisdom. Kno knew more about the Talmud than anyone else on the planet. Um, so his book, The Essential Talmud, is a wonderful, readable, not too thick volume that you don't have to read cover to cover, but can give you a lot of information on how to understand what the Talmud is. My friends, this is my, that is my entire preamble. I wanted to begin with a long kind of discussion. Uh, I apologize for the frontal nature. For those of you who are studying for the first time, uh, most of you um, haven't yet gotten used to my style of teaching. Um, usually my opening remarks are 10 to 15 minutes. Um, today they were longer. Um, I'd like to in invite questions or comments just to clarify anything I've said so far so that we can proceed and actually learn some Talmud today. Uh, Susan Esther. Yes, very briefly. First of all, thank you so much. It was inspiring, confusing, and a cause for much speculation and uh, thorough uh, analysis. But my question is this. Um, I come from a family who's not very versed, and the rabbis have a sing-song to the, the, uh, their presentation, and you briefly touched upon that. And I wondered, at what point, what century 
did that become common practice? Right. So um, first of all, there is a sing-songness to lots of traditional rabbinic teaching, including the Talmud, but it isn't actually notated with any kind of cantillation marks, unlike the Torah and the Tanakh, the, the Haftarah, the special scrolls that are read on the holidays. There are no designated musical notations for reciting Talmud. But if you get used to reading Talmud, you may even hear it in my voice, I'll start to inflect things in patterns so that you can hear what are statements and what are questions. And there are all sorts of legalese shorthands that have their own music in quotation marks. But I think, Susan Esther, what you are specifically asking is about the musical notations that are provided so that Jewish readers can properly read a scriptural text by chanting it. Um, and we remind kids all the time who are preparing for bar and bat mitzvah. I guess, you know, Jessica, can I put you on the spot? Liam, is he chanting Torah in a couple weeks for his bar mitzvah? Right? I, I, I see you nodding. Yeah. Yes. So I'm doing your son's bar mitzvah in a couple weeks. I'm doing it. He's doing it. <laughs> I'm merely uh, I'm merely calling out page numbers and get to say a few nice things. But um, yeah, Liam is learning to chant Torah for the primary purpose that that's the easiest way to learn Torah, right? How many of you can sing along with any number of songs that pop up on the radio without ever trying to have memorized these songs? The music allows text to stick. Additionally, the value for Hebrew readers is that the, the cantillation allows you to provide the proper um, punctuation, where to pause in the course of reading a sentence and syntax which words get emphasized and in what direction the sentences flow. All of that is provided through the art of cantillation. That tradition, uh, Susan, was finalized by the eighth century or the 800s, don't, don't come, mm -hmm. it's either the eighth or the ninth century of the common era by this group of scholars uh, who are fairly enigmatic, meaning we don't know a whole lot about why they organized themselves, what they exactly were doing, but a, a group of biblical scholars called the Masoretes who took it upon themselves to provide a definitive code of cantillation marks, which would provide, and vowels, by the way, they were the ones who put the vowels in the text. Hebrew, this is hard for people to understand. Hebrew does not have vowels, right? When you read Torah, mm -hmm. people often say, well, the vowels are missing. That's not really accurate. It is accurate to say the Torah is the Torah, and a later community of scholars called the Masoretes in the ninth century added the vowels as well as the cantillation marks because the vowels give the declensions and conjugations and forms of verbs and nouns that are needed to understand the text, as well as the cantillation marks, which are punctuation and syntax. A few of you who are Hebrew readers are nodding because you, you understand this because that's how you learn Hebrew. Um, but you can read a Hebrew text and all Israelis do without vowels. And by the way, their pronunciation is generally 98% accurate because there are only certain rules that govern which vowels can go where, depending on what consonants are in a word. I know, that seems, I know that seems confusing, but once you become really immersed in the Hebrew language, you start to realize that the vowels are mostly extraneous, but in Torah they're not, because they really dictate the sense. And so the vowels become part of the codified tradition, but they were not biblically codified. Many, many, many centuries later were they codified. Thank you so much. Any other questions that would provide clarification before we read some Talmud? Barbara, was that a hand up? You have to unmute kindly. Yeah. Uh, the Talmud isn't chanted. Correct. The Talmud is not chanted. Okay. So Even in traditional setting, like again, there's this sing-songy cadence to traditional presentations of Talmud, but it's not like the schools of reciters for uh, the the Bible, the biblical community, you, know, you go to shul, you hear the Torah chanted, um, or the Quran is chanted. It is not scripture, it is not chanted. So even, even people that are, uh, even uh, students that are trying to memorize it, don't memorize it in a chant. Correct. But there are amazing, I mean, the human capacity for memorization, for people who I think have a certain gift for it, um, is astonishing. I had a boy whose bar mitzvah I conducted just this past Saturday who has 500 digits of pi memorized. Wow. Like, I, I, I don't know how you do that. 
I had a professor at HUC who was interred, I think, in uh, Theresienstadt, one of the Nazi camps, um, as a boy, Ben Sion Wacholder of blessed memory, who was a Talmud prodigy. And he explained to um, that uh, he uh, would comfort himself by sitting alone and memorizing Talmud. Now, the astonishing thing about Professor Wacholder is that he was blind wow. and he would teach Talmud from memory to our classes. Um, he, it is said of him, and who knows whether or not this is just a legend, but there is a particular test uh, to know whether or not you're dealing with a true genius of Talmud. It's called the pin test. It means that if you take a long pin and were to insert it through a word of Talmud on any folio or page, pages in Talmuds were originally folios, just like Shakespeare, um, that a Talmud genius can tell you what word is penetrated on the other side and on the next folio and on the other side and on the folio after that, all the way through the Talmud. Now, again, whether or not that is uh, literally to be taken, you know, or figuratively to be taken, Wacholder and others are true Talmud geniuses, as was Steinsaltz. They could memorize and recite from memory vast tracts of Talmud. Um, it will astonish you all the more when you see how complex this literature is. Michelle Braun. Hi, just to do a quick recap of the timeline. So Mishnah was codified second century CE. Third century CE. So like by the two thirties. Yep. Okay. And then we have the. Amoraim through, let's say the 500s. And then the Savoraim through 700. But there are some late daters. We call them in the scholarly community who think the Talmud is more like 800. But most people agree that somewhere between 700 and 800 of the common era, we have Mishnah and Gemara in its finished form, what is collectively known as Talmud. By the way, everything I've told you is still inadequate to describe what you would look at when you see an actual page of Talmud, because it's not just Mishnah and Gemara. In this class, we will focus exclusively on Mishnah Gemara. The Mishnah, the early part of the law, and especially Gemara, the way in which the Mishnah gets expanded or exploded outward. The uh, Alan asks a very funny question. He said, when does the arcing of the thumb start, right? So it's like, but Rabbi Akiva says, this, there's this like conventional, like uh, cliched rabbinic hand gesture. Alan, I have no idea, but you and I both know what we're talking about. Like if you listen to the way rabbis teach Talmud, go on YouTube. There are all these Orthodox rabbis who teach Talmud. However, Perhaps it is the case, this thing, right? Is that what you're referring to? Absolutely. It's like yeah. in the Gemara. But in says... the Gemara, right. <laughs> There's like this, like we can do a Talmud parody just based on inflection and hand gestures. But in the Gemara, I think it's just a way for a teacher to bring alive a very confusing text by saying, okay, we're, we've got this idea out here, but here's a contradicting idea. However... Another group of scholars comes in and says X. All of this, I promise you, we're going to look at actual Gemara today. Mom and dad, your comment, please. Where, where do um, sages like Maimonides and Rashi fit Great. into this? Great. So after the Gemara is completed, if you think that 800 is where the Talmud stops, think again. Um, later generations of sages will add their own wisdom to it. And Rashi and Maimonides... Rashi uh, from Northern France, Maimonides originally from Spain by way of North Africa, uh, eventually residing in Cairo. Um, both are found on any given page of Talmud, as well as Rabbi Yitzchak of Fez, uh, better known as the Reef, which is just an abbreviation or an acronym for Rabbi Yitzchak of Fez, the Reef. Um, and in some cases, all the way up to the greatest Talmudic sage of the 19th century, uh, the Vilna Gaon, literally the genus, the genius of Vilnius, Lithuania. They're all on a page of Talmud. And the way it's arranged is sort of like the cross section of an onion. In the middle, Mishnah. Mi below Mishnah, Gemara. Inevitably, the Gemara section is much longer than Mishnah. So you have a couple lines of Mishnah, and then beneath it, Gemara. 
And then on the inside margin, Rashi. And on the kind of like the corner margin, Maimonides. And then on the other margin, a school of uh, exegetes, rabbinic scholars known as the Tosafists, not to be confused with the Tosefta, but from the same root, meaning we've got something additional to say, the Tosafists, and then the commentaries on the Tosafists, and then all of the marginal notes, and then the Vilna Gaon, and outward and outward and outward. So it actually is helpful to see in the Back to the Sources book in Goldenberg's essay, like he actually does a very helpful thing. He provides us with a, um, a drawn schematic of a page of Talmud. Um, so uh, this is a representative look at a page of Talmud, right? So you can even see here, you don't have to read it. First word in a nice wooden frame, not a wooden frame, but like a, a decorative frame is the first word of the mission. This is the first page of Talmud, page 2A. <laughs> what happened to page one? Oh, there's a whole lot of like Bubba Mices about this. Um, many people say that the first page is missing in order to remind the student that there is no beginning and there is no end to Talmud study. The real reason is that folios were bound in a way so that there was always room for a title page. And every folio was a side A and a side B. So every tractate of Talmud, every new topical section of Talmud begins with an A side and a B side. Um, this is a broken down schematic. So this is a very helpful book. He tells you what's what. Here is Mishnah, and then down here is Gemara. Inside margin here is Rashi's commentary. Uh, other margin here, Tosafis, I believe Maimonides, but I, I, this is the only section we're going to be focusing on in our study of Talmud, the inner layers of the onion, Mishnah Gemara. You can also just call that Gemara. You can also just call it Talmud. My friends, let us bless. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu. These words you know. Praised is the one source of all life who has made our lives holy with mitzvot and who commands us, and now you repeat after me, la'asok b'divrei Torah, to immerse ourselves in sacred words of learning. That's what we're here to do. And I'll offer another blessing as we inaugurate our study and begin Talmud. Baruch atarunai Eloheinu melech haolam shehecheanu v'kiyamanu v'higiyanu lazman hazeh. Thank you to the one who has given us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this moment, this new year 2023, this new course of study. Let us begin. So what I am bringing on screen now is from the absolutely astonishing tool Safari, which now has an iPhone app. I downloaded it this week. It's amazing. It's truly amazing. Um, belongs on every Jewish owner's iPhone. Um, I think they have an Android app too, if you are one of those benighted souls who still uses Android as your platform. Um, oh no, all good. We have an internal clergy debate at WRT about Android iPhone. Um, you can just easily go to Talmud um, and I'll show you how this works. Um, so you can actually see me doing it on screen. So you bring up Safaria. Um, which is this website, sepharia.org. See it right here. And you go to its library of texts, which comes up first, you hit Talmud, and then you find the tractate you want to study. Um, I had thought, even up to last night, that we would start at the very beginning. For as it is said in the Sound of Music, a very good place to start. However, I changed my mind because it is so hard. The first page of Talmud, Shabbat 2A, or Barachot rather, 2A, this page here, is like toothbreakingly hard. So we're going to start with something, we may come back to it, but we're actually going to start with something meaningful. We're going to start in tractate Baba Metzia, which literally means the middle gate. Don't worry about that. that the names of the tractates don't happen to mean a lot. And we're going to be looking at tractate uh, 59 A and B. Okay. We are not going to be talking about engaging in intercourse with a woman. You can see the text on your screen. We're going to scroll all the way down to the very end of, this is just one page, by the way. This is just the A side of a page. 
the very, okay. This is the section we are learning. We are going to start with a Mishnah because Mishnah is always where the learning begins, but the Gemara, the later layers of Amoraitic discussion and Savoraitic redaction make up the real heart of Talmud study. Please bear with me. I'm going to do a little bit of Hebrew and Aramaic. The Mishnah is written in Hebrew. There are loan words from Greek here and there, but for the most part, the Mishnah is written in rabbinic Hebrew. If you know Hebrew, I often remind people Mishnah is easy. And I hope that if you've been studying with us for a long time, you got a sense of, hey, I can do this. I know a bunch of these words. I can figure it out. Even if you don't know a ton of Hebrew, Talmud is not written only in Hebrew. It is written in Hebrew for the Mishnaic parts and the Tosefta that gets quoted and the Baraita that gets quoted. Because remember, there are three um, components of Tanaitic or early reciter literature. The Mishnah is the core, the additional Tosefta, and the extraneous cutting room floor Baraita. All of that is basically Hebrew. But the Gemara, the much larger section of the Talmud, is Aramaic, which was the vernacular of the Jewish people for most of our history. It is the language that Jesus spoke and all the other early rabbis, but for whatever reason, it was not the language in which the Mishnah was written. The Mishnah was written in the sacred tongue of Hebrew. The Gemara is written in Aramaic. So the Talmud flip-flops Hebrew Aramaic, Hebrew Aramaic, Hebrew Aramaic. Very, very hard. I am reasonably confident as a Hebrew reader and translator. I'm really lousy with Aramaic. Like I, I, I'm going to do my best. I can pronounce it well, but it's very hard. Okay. Tanan Chatam. We're actually um, in uh, Aramaic already. Tanan Chatam means it was taught there. So we, and this is very helpful. When you're reading on Safaria, it provides you with a translation of the actual text in boldface, and everything else is interpolation. The translator is, you can see, there's as much or more interpolation than actual words. If you were reading this, Tanan Chatam just means we learned over there. Here it says, apropos the topic of verbal mistreatment, don't worry about that. That's just linking you to the stuff that came right before it. Tanan Chatam, we learned there, and because the word is Tanan, Tana, it is Mishnaic. Tanan Chatam, Hitchuchuliot, Venatan Chul, Bein Chulia, Lechulia, Rabbi Eliezer Mitaher, Vachamim Mitamein. Okay, that's, he that's Hebrew Aramaic mixed. We learned in a Mishnah there in Mishnah Kalim 510. Don't worry, that's just referring you. You want to go look up chapter and verse in the Mishnah, you look up tractate Kalim. Kalim means utensils. So there's a whole Mishnah about utensils. I know some of you are thinking, Blake, you're losing me. Why are we talking about spatulas? And we're not going to talk about spatulas. We're going to talk about ovens. We're talking about a particular oven today. This is interesting for me because I had an oven repairman here on Monday. So I've been thinking a lot about ovens this week. If one cut an earthenware oven widthwise, notice how it doesn't say earthenware oven widthwise. It just says if one cut into segments, you've got to go back to Kaylee and know we're talking about an oven. So this is a particular kind of ceramic kiln, right? Picture it, a ceramic kiln. In fact, I can show you what kind of, a, uh, of an item we're talking about. Um, so if we look, there's a particular kind of earthenware oven, and I can do a little image search for it. And we're talking about something that probably looked like this. I will show you on screen. This guy here, an earthenware oven. It actually says, it, 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 I'm sorry, the, the print, I've enlarged it, so it's a little bit jaggedy, but the likeness of the oven of Achnai which is this particular kind of oven based on an oven discovered at Masada. So we actually have a, um, an archeological relic that backs up something that the Talmud is talking about. So the, the rabbis are talking about how do we determine the ritual status of an oven like this? 
Now, in order to understand the discussion, you got to know that the rabbis are focused on areas that most Reformed Jews aren't thinking about on the day-to-day. Every food that is to be prepared has to be prepared in a kosher way. That means the manner of slaughter, if it is meat. That means the vessels that are used to prepare it, both the utensils that are used to manipulate the food, the knives, the silverware, the spatulas, and the vessels in which it is either contained or stored or cooked. All have to be kosher or ritually pure. The words for pure and impure in this case are tahor, which means pure, and tameh, which means impure. Does not have to do with perceptible schmutz, right? Just because something looks dirty or clean doesn't make it ritually pure or impure. It has to do with whether or not it's been koshered properly. If you need more of an exegesis on this, I don't want to help you today. Like that's a whole subset of Jewish thought and practice is how to kosher vessels. But that's what we're talking about. The oven needs to be pure. Now, ritual purity, or or more particularly impurity, can be contained, uh, sorry, can be conveyed in a vessel. If, for instance, you have a vessel like an earthenware jug that comes into contact with some non-kosher substance, let us say a lizard crawls into your jug. Well, now you got a problem because a lizard is a non-kosher animal. It's a source of ritual impurity, and the whole jug is made impure. But there's a procedure by which it can be made kosher again, can be made pure again. That involves dipping it in water. Okay, you can take your utensils to the mikveh even today and and kosher them that way. What about an oven? Well, if an oven is a complete vessel, the rabbis are going to argue it functions like a vessel. It can be unkoshered if it comes into contact with a uh, impurifying agent, but it can also be koshered again. I promise you this gets interesting. Bear with me. Okay, so that's the, that's the oven we're talking about. I'm going to bring the text back on screen. If one, Suppose one wants to transport one's oven. All right, you've got this big ceramic kiln. It's too heavy to lift by itself. So you want to break it into segments and then reassemble it with mortar or sand, right? Sand like a kind of probably more like a uh, a sandy mortar that you could then cut your ceramic into segments and then put it back together. Rabbi Eliezer deems it ritually pure. An oven that has been reassembled from component segments Because of the sand, its legal status, he believes, is not that of a complete vessel, and therefore it is not susceptible to ritual impurity. That is all explanatory from the translator here. Doesn't say that in the Talmud, but it's helpful to know. But the rabbis, meaning everyone else at the time, says, no, that is not kosher because it actually is a complete oven. Right, and a complete oven If it's functioning as a unified vessel, it is susceptible to ritual impurity. If, however, it's made of just component pieces of ceramic and isn't an enclosed structure, then it can't be unkoshered. That's the debate. Okay, who cares, you might ask. Now let's find out. We go to 59B. We just flip the folio and we're on the other side. Vize hu tanor shel achnai. That's the first line. This is Hebrew. This is the oven of achnai. Now, an achnai is an Aramaic word that means a snake. This is a snake oven. Doesn't mean that you're cooking snakes in it. It probably also does not mean that the snake is the agent that causes it to be unkoshered. It may be because it looks like a coiled snake. Can you call up in your mind the picture of that oven, which is sort of this trapezoidal domed structure? It looks like a cobra wrapped around itself. In fact, if you Google the term oven of Achnai, there are a whole bunch of images that come up on your screen. It's fascinating. So of course, like I spent some time doing this and I found this picture. I found a picture of an oven, 
or sorry, I found a picture of a coiled snake that looks exactly like the oven of Achnai. So I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. It looks like this. So here you go. An oven that looks like a coiled snake. That's, that's obviously a digital photo. It's not a real thing. But they're trying to show how these ovens, here's another picture of some ceramics that were found. See how it looks like a coiled snake? And so the idea is that you've got this specific kind of oven that looks like a coiled snake. It's known as the oven of Achnai. There's a debate in the community of rabbis. Rabbi Eliezer, the lone voice, says, this item is not ritually pure. Sorry, it is ritually pure because it's, it is to be understood as its individual component segments. I've chopped up the oven. I'm going to reassemble it. But it is, at this point, it is ritually pure because it can't be tainted by a ritually defiling agent. The rabbis say, no, no, no. It's a complete oven. It was broken into pieces, but it's still a complete oven. That, that's all we're debating about. You could say, I'm a Reformed Jew who cares about this, and then I will respond to you. The text we're now going to study for the next 25 minutes is the paramedic, paradigmatic text for why Reformed Jews should study Talmud. Okay. In order to do that, I need to bring the text back on screen. So I, pardon me, as, as those of you know, me know, there's a lot of like flipping between tabs and uh, I'm five weeks rusty. So we're going to do our best to, to bear with my, my sluggishness on the tabs. Here we go. This is known as the oven of Achnai. The Gemara asks, so the later layer of Talmud says, what is the relevance of Achnai, a snake in this context? So they were puzzled over this name too. Why does it, what, what does a snake have to do with it? I gave you the answer what I think archaeological evidence suggests. The oven looks like a snake. But Rabbi Yehuda said that Shmuel said, this is very Talmudic. I'm going to quote my teacher who quotes his teacher. Whether or not those teachers historically actually said that the way we have it is irrelevant. The point is that the Talmud presents us with a rigorous attention to quoting your sources. Rabbi Yehuda said that Shmuel said, it is characterized in that manner. In other words, it's called the snake oven due to the fact that the rabbis surrounded it with their statements like this snake right? So in other words, it's a metaphor. The oven doesn't look like a snake so much as the oven becomes a subject of rabbinic discussion and we coil our arguments around the discussion of the oven like a snake coils itself around its object. Okay? A snake which often forms a coil when it rests, that is not in the Talmud. That's just translation. And they deemed it impure because they viewed it as a whole vessel. The sages taught on that day, meaning on the day that this argument came up in the academy, Rabbi Eliezer answered all possible answers in the world to support his opinion. Obviously a bit of a hyperbole, but Rabbi Eliezer was dug in. But the rabbis did not accept his explanations from him. All right, this is where the text is important for us. What we're really, the oven doesn't matter. And this is one of the things that's really challenging about studying Talmud. It's easy to get obsessive about the thing you think you're studying, and then you realize that's not the thing the rabbis actually care about. The oven is just, uh, it's like a MacGuffin, right? The object that all of the people in a Hitchcock movie are chasing after, that everyone wants, the object has no intrinsic significance for the story that we're here to tell. It could have been an oven. It doesn't matter. The point is that you've got a whole group of rabbis who think that the kosher status of this vessel is X, and Rabbi Eliezer says not X. So now we're going to get into a dialogue about, so what did they do? How did they figure this out? Okay. Here's what the text actually says in Hebrew, uh, and this is uh, in Hebrew, not Aramaic. Amar lahem, he said to them, that is, Rabbi Eliezer said to them, Im halacha kemoti, charuv ze yochiach. All right. If, so after failing to convince the rabbis logically, because remember, the last thing we learned is he answered all possible answers in the world. He gave them every logical reason why his oven should be viewed in one way, 
And the rabbi said, we disagree. No, that's not, we don't share your opinion. Thank you, Rabbi Eliezer. Has anyone, anyone who's a teacher has had a student like this, right? No matter how much you try to convince him or her, there's one person in the back who says, sorry, no. Like, so you've got this, what could we call Rabbi Eliezer? A nudnik perhaps? He insists that he's right and he brings every logical argument, but now logic is failing to persuade the community of rabbis. So what do you do, right? And here's where things get really wild. So he decides, okay, if I can't persuade you logically, I'm going to have to bring out the big guns. After failing to convince the rabbis logically, Rabbi Eliezer said to them, if the halakha, halakha is the word that means Jewish law, and this is a matter of halakha. Most of the Talmud is about halakha. But as you will see, the Talmud is also, like the Mishnah, not a law code. Law codes, don't, any lawyers in the room? Law codes don't work like this. Highly digressive, narrative uh, rabbit holes down which to go. Folklore, Bubba Mises, stories, extraneous material, not a law code. But its primary pursuit is the elucidation of matters of Jewish law. So we can say that the, that the Talmud is a chief halachic text. Um, and by the way, Maimonides, when he wasn't commenting on the Talmud, since my dad asked, was also writing his own codification of Jewish law known as the Mishnah Torah. And he was also writing one of the greatest works of Jewish philosophy called The Guide to the Perplexed. So Maimonides had three master literary projects, commentary on the Talmud, Mishnah Torah, his code of law, and his book of philosophy called Guide to the Perplexed. And that's when he wasn't busy as a court figure and a physician, an astonishing, an astonishing historical personage. Back to Rabbi Eliezer in the academy with the rabbis. If the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, he says, this carob tree will prove it. He said, let this carob tree prove it. All right, so he points to a tree. Imagine this like scene in an outdoor amphitheater. And he says, see that carob tree over there, gentlemen? That carob tree is going to prove that if I'm right, it's going to do something amazing. And at that moment, the carob tree was uprooted from its place 100 cubits. That's like half the length of a football field. All right, so woo, carob tree just pops up. The rabbi said to him, one does not, not cite halachic proof from a carob tree. In other words, nice try, Eliezer, but that proves nothing. But somehow Eli Eliezer, nudnik that he is, is not going to relent. Rabbi Eliezer then said to them, if the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, this stream over here will prove it. And at that moment, the water in the stream turned backward and began flowing in the opposite direction. So two miracles that are worked, obviously a miracle in the conventional sense of a miracle when the laws of nature are turned on their head. Something supernatural is happening here. And the rabbis responded to Rabbi Eliezer, one does not cite halakhic proof from a stream. It's like, no, we're still not persuaded. Rabbi Eliezer then said to them, if the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, the walls of the study hall will prove it. And the walls of the study hall leaned inward and began to fall. All right, so you've got this incredible scene where the yeshiva itself is about to collapse because Rabbi Eliezer has summoned these miracles to prove that his take on this obscure bit of law about the kosher status of an oven is correct. And at that moment, another rabbi stands up. This guy, Rabbi Joshua, Rabbi Yehoshua, scolded the walls and said to them, so he's not talking to Rabbi Eliezer, he's saying, walls of the yeshiva, if the, Torah, if the Torah scholars are contending with each other in matters of halakha, what is the nature of your involvement in this dispute? In other words, you stay out of this. Walls, you have nothing to do with this. This is between Eliezer and us. You Leave us alone. The Gemara relates, 
the walls did not fall because of the deference due to Rabbi Yehoshua. So the walls were like, oh, okay, I guess we'll stop collapsing. But they also did not right themselves. They did not straighten back up because of deference due to Rabbi Eliezer. And they still remain leaning to this day. So now you've got this, but we still haven't resolved what's happening here. Rabbi Eliezer then said to them, if the, meaning to the rabbis, not to the walls anymore, if the halakha is in accordance with my opinion, heaven will prove it. Heaven is always a stand-in for God. I am going to summon God himself to solve this halakhic debate. And at that moment, what is called a bat kol. I don't know if you can see where my cursor is moving. Bat kol. Literally, the daughter of a voice. But it is a specific rabbinic term that means a heavenly voice. Just a voice emerges from on high. The Amra, and it says, Malachem etzel Rabbi Eliezer, Shalacha Kimoto. Okay, the Cholmakom. This is what, uh, there are a lot of abbreviations in Talmud too, so you got to know these abbreviations. So literally, it says, the Amra, it says, Malachem etzel Rabbi Eliezer. What do you have to do with Rabbi Eliezer? What, in other words, what's your beef with Rabbi Eliezer? So the heavenly voice is actually upbraiding the rabbis, saying, What's your problem with Rabbi Eliezer here? Because in every other instance, this rabbi speaks definitively to what the halacha is. Those of you who studied Mishnah and Pirkei Avot with me have actually met Rabbi Eliezer before. Early, early, early in our study of Pirkei Avot, we're going back almost two years, Rabbi Eliezer was likened to a cistern that does not fail. It's very interesting, by the way, that we're talking about a vessel and its kosher status, and Rabbi Eliezer himself is metaphorized or analogized to a complete vessel. Rabbi Eliezer was known in the scholarly community for being a great memorizer of tradition and whose chief effort as a rabbi was to preserve and promote the teachings that he learned from his predecessors in exactly the form they were given to him. So the heavenly voice is saying, hey, rabbis, what's your problem with Eliezer over here? Every time the guy has given a halacha, it's right. I'm going to pause here now to take your questions. Anything that is not yet, that is not clear or that you'd like to know more about from this text, now's a chance. But I'm I'm going to, I promise we'll get to the conclusion of the text, which is absolutely astonishing. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments, or questions. Mom and Dad, you can chime in first. And then Andy yes, Frankel, you can go next, but you're, I'm going to mute you until then. The very first line of this passage said something about cursing somebody out. Mm. Or, I mean, yep. what did that have to do with anything that followed? Um, what it has to do with is the apparent uh, severity of the argument between the rabbis and Rabbi Eliezer. Um, ultimately what this is actually, it, it, it's, it really is not related. I tried to figure out how they're connected. And unfortunately, the Talmud often does this. It'll say, and by the way, related to this, and then it'll be like, as Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different, the reader is left to conjecture, what the hell does this have to do with what came before? For our intents and purposes, not relevant, but I anticipated the question and concluded, it probably is because there was a such a significant rupture in the rabbinic community over this issue. That's what the rabbis are trying to convey. Okay, Steve Matt. Oh, Andy Frankel, did you want to chime in? Going once. Okay, Steve Maskett, you're next. I wonder why the feminine sense. I'm sorry, Barbara, what did you say? Oh, I'm sorry. I was asking, saying to my husband, I wonder why they use the feminine tense. For? Uh, you I'm said um, Amra. Because it's a bat kol. It's literally the daughter of a voice. But then they're calling God, uh, then they're calling God feminine. Indeed. Hmm. Yeah. It is one of the many places, though they are not as uh, often disclosed or discussed, where God is encoded in some kind of feminine terminology or morphology, meaning imagery. Imagery and language associated with God throughout rabbinic literature is dominantly masculine and occasionally feminine. 
But the Shekhinah is, isn't there yet. Correct. But it will be. <laughs> okay. uh, Steve Maskett. So I found it interesting that the school remains neutral, right? Kind of. But but I I was fascinated that there wasn't a, a denouement with respect to the to the river or or the earlier reference. I mean, they just yeah, so uh, presumably carob tree is still down the field, river is still flowing yeah. the wrong way. House of study did not collapse only because you had two master sages, each of whom earned the respect of the walls of the house of study. But the but dominant, but, but the, the but the house didn't remain untouched either. Correct. The house the walls are warped or leaning. Oh. Okay. So now now we 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 do get a conclusion not to the stream and the carob tree, but we do get a suitable denouement here, and it, I really think it will blow your mind. And I hope by choosing this text, it will set you up for intrigue to continue studying for the next four weeks. Um, this is going to be a really fun ride. Um, and by the way, we're proceeding topically. I'm going to choose a different section of Talmud at random. It's not the traditional way of studying Talmud, but the name of this course is Introduction to Talmud. I really want you to get a little bit of the flavor of Talmud. And then if we ever wanted to do a sequential dive through a tractate, that's going to require some, you know, real um, mental and intestinal fortitude. Um, but all right, so here we are, we're looking at the oven of Achnai, which is, by the way, if you Google this passage, if you want to find it for yourself, just Google the oven of Achnai, A-K-H-N-A-I, the snake oven, um, which doesn't, as you now know, has nothing to do with the oven of Achnai. The oven of Achnai is the MacGuffin. It's not intrinsically significant. All right. So where we left our, our story is here. We left our story with this intriguing notion that a divine voice comes out of nowhere. Because, well, not comes out of nowhere. Eliezer summons God to weigh in. He says, come on, God, you know, throw me a bone here. Help me out. And God's voice, the bat kol, the mysterious voice from heaven says, Hey, rabbis, why are you arguing with this great sage, Rabbi Eliezer, given the fact that every time we have a matter of Jewish law, he's always right? Why can't you just accept that his view is that this segmented, chopped apart, reassembled oven does not count as a complete vessel and therefore cannot take on ritual impurity? And the rabbis say, no, it's an oven. It's a minor matter of halakha with massive consequences. Some of this should be read as a metaphor. This whole thing is a parable. One way of understanding what I'm saying by saying it's a parable is the walls of the very academy itself are nearing collapse because of this, right? So the consequences of a little debate over a halakha about an oven lead to the near collapse of the academy. That's a metaphor, right? This almost undid the rabbinic community. That's what's at stake here. The ability of the rabbis to provide guidance and law for the Jewish people, that very thing is at stake. And God's own voice is here to settle the debate. Now, if I stopped teaching here, you would think that that would be the end of the story, but of course it's not. Rabbi Yehoshua, remember, he's the opponent in this drama. He stands up again and he says, it is not in heaven. He does something very interesting here. He quotes a line from the Torah. Lines from the Torah have their own divine authority. So if God's voice is what just spoke and said, leave Rabbi Eliezer alone, he's always right. Rabbi Yehoshua says, two can play at that game. I too can be God's voice. And he quotes not just any line. He says, lo b'shamayim hi. If you know those words, it's because I chant them every year on Yom Kippur morning. They're part of the Yom Kippur morning Torah reading, where Moses is giving a little pep talk to the Israelites before they cross over the Jordan and inhabit the promised land at last. And he says, the thing that God is asking you to do is not too hard, nor is it beyond your reach. It is not across the sea that one might have to say, who shall go across the sea and get this for us? nor is it in the heavens, that's the verse, it is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to the heavens and bring this for us? 
bring this down for us. No, the thing is near to you. It is in your heart and it is in your mouth and you can do it. So it's this beautiful sermon about you have the Torah tradition. It belongs to you. Um, when I rehearse for a bar bat mitzvah, the day before the big day, on the Friday afternoon. I show every family how to take a Torah scroll out of the ark, how to undress it, and how to pose with it for photographs. But it's more than that. Many families are squeamish and they say, well, will you be here Saturday morning at 8.30 to supervise taking the Torah out of the ark? I say, absolutely not. First of all, the service doesn't start till 10, so I'm not showing up at 8.30 for your photo shoot. If you want to take a Torah out of the ark, and you should, the Torah belongs to you. The Torah does not belong to the rabbis. And despite what the lawyers for the synagogue may say, and our insurance agents especially may say, the Torah does not belong to Westchester Reform Temple. It belongs to the Jewish people. So that's what Joshua is saying. It is not in heaven. In other words, it is not up to God to decide matters of Jewish law. The Gemara asks, what is the relevance of the phrase, it is not in heaven in this context? Rabbi Yirmiyah says, Jeremiah it's just the Hebrew for Jeremiah says, since the Torah was already given at Mount Sinai, we do not regard a divine voice, I would put in brackets, as authoritative, as you already wrote at Mount Sinai in the Torah after a majority to incline. That's an obscure verse, but the way it's being used here is we believe in majority rules. We do not solve Jewish legal disputes with miracles involving carob trees or streams, or walls, or even with a divine voice. God gave us the Torah at Sinai. It was a gift. It is ours to use. And in that very Torah is another line. So the first line is, it is not in heaven anymore. God does not own the Torah. He gave it to us. And there's this wonderful line in Exodus, you, maj you incline after a majority. In other words, follow majority rule. And here's the gloss on it. Since the majority of the rabbis disagreed with Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, the halakha is not ruled in accordance with his opinion. So Rabbi Eliezer loses. Why? Because a majority of rabbis disagreed with him. The Gemara, oh, let's pause there. I'll take Audrey's comment and I'll probably go five minutes over so that we can complete the passage. Okay. I'm just curious. It seems to me that this would give rise to a lot of politics. Mm -hmm. Indeed it does. Uh, but what, but imagine the, imagine if Rabbi Eliezer had been upheld. I think he should have been. One consequence of that potentially is that a single rabbi who could summon miracles from on high could override the entire academy. Well, that may be, but uh, if there's something about the divine, isn't that supposed to be the ultimate? Isn't it? Or yes. is it? I mean, what is, what is radical and astonishing about this text is exactly the way in which it challenges that premise. Right. And you're going to see, by the way, overriding the divine is yeah. exactly where this concludes. So hold that thought. Thank you for the comment. Mom and dad, quick, quick interjection, and then we move on. I think you answered the question about what the first line is doing there. It seems to suggest that the following passage is going to be metaphorically interpreted as to what can happen when disputation gets out of hand, you can collapse the whole yeshiva. I love that. Great. Okay, here's, what, here's where it happens. So we follow majority rule. And since the majority of the rabbis disagreed with Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, the halakha is not ruled in accordance with his opinion. The Gemara relates. So now here's the coda to the story. Years later, Rabbi Natan encountered Elijah, the prophet, the biblical guy. You know Elijah, shows up at the Passover Seder, hangs out at Briss's, shows up for Havdalah. He's the harbinger of a redeemed world in the Messianic era. He's a really important figure in Jewish lore and literature. Rabbi Natan meets Elijah and says, what did God do at that time? What did the Holy One, blessed be he, do at that time when Rabbi Yehoshua issued this declaration? What was God thinking about all this? You've got a rabbi who stands up in the academy and says, we follow majority rule. God's voice is irrelevant. You might think God was insulted. God was furious. 
Rabbi Natan gets his answer from Elijah. How does Elijah know? Because Elijah's hanging out with God all the time, comes back for visits. Elijah is the one figure in Jewish tradition, a couple others, but the one figure who doesn't die. He gets sucked up into the whirlwind at the end of his life. The, the Bible actually reports this. And so the legend is that Isaac is still, not Isaac, Elijah is still alive. And he comes back to promise the Messianic era is nigh. That's why he pops up at Havdalah at the end of Shabbat, because Shabbat is like a little appetizer portion of a Messianic world, a redeemed world. That's why he pops up at Abris, because every new child that enters the covenant of the people is a harbinger of a redeemed world. And that's why he pops up at the end of the Seder, because the Seder is a liberation festival that promises a world redeemed. So Elijah makes cameos in Jewish life. And he's this figure who keeps popping up to say, hey, the world could be better, couldn't it? Maybe it will be. All right. So Elijah knows. He says, the Holy One, blessed be he, smiled and said, Nitzachuni v'ni. That the word is Nitzchuni v'ni, Nitzchuni v'ni, right here. I, Elijah says, my children have triumphed over me. My children have triumphed over me. Or I prefer the word bested me. My children have bested me. Um, so uh, God smiles and says, my children have bested me. Now, there are lots of different ways of reading that. But one thing is conclusive. It, God does not seem to be angry. So what, what is this really all about? At the end of the story, we have this kind of conclusive statement that we follow majority rule in the yeshiva. Halacha being a matter of interpretation of Jewish law is not for God to decide. And even a rabbi who is considered a, if not the authority in halacha, cannot override a majority vote. He is one voice and he's badly outnumbered. It's not like he has a mass of supporters either. He is the only rabbi in this situation who believes what he believes about the status of this oven. But he believes it so adamantly that he's willing to resort to all manner of not just logical persuasion, but also miracles, summoning into the academy the very voice of God itself, only to discover that he is not only outvoted by a majority, but that the Torah itself is used to authorize majority rule overriding even a miraculous voice of God weighing in on the situation. And how did God feel about it? Well, according to the one person who's able to report, who is Elijah, God laughed or smiled and said, my kids win. Steve Maskin comments. To me, this is the continuum of the, the ultimate victory of the rabbis over the priestly class. The Pharisees bested the Sadducees and followed through and, and, <clears throat> And, and Judaism is one of constant reinvention. Beautiful. You can see now why I said about a half hour ago that this is the paradigmatic text for a reform Jewish community to be studying. Now, there are, um, it's interesting, there are other places where uh, similar weight is given to um, the people. And, and, and what I want to emphasize is that just so that we reform Jews can take ourselves down a notch and not get too high and mighty about our own authority in the Jewish tradition, it's still not willy-nilly. It never says individual Jews get to decide for themselves what Jewish law is, right? It's a community of authorized scholars ruling in the majority has the authority to determine Jewish law above even a recognized expert who somehow is able to get God to speak on his behalf and, and be his defense attorney and say, Eliezer's great. Eliezer's always right. Joshua gets the final word and says, no, the Torah is ours. The Torah was given at Mount Sinai. 
given away for us to use as we see fit. It is, it is one of my all-time favorite passages, not just in Jewish literature, but in all of literature. Um, the, the way in which it so boldly claims the authority of a rabbinic community. But I do want to emphasize, again, community, not just, hi, I'm Joe Jew, and I've decided that, you know, pork is kosher. No, it doesn't work that way. If a majority of the authorities do not believe that you can kosher pork, pork stays unkosher. But <laughs> But the point is that if Joe Jew did stand up, and even if he were a halakhic authority, and even if God said, you know, I've decided that we're going to have ham over this year because pork is now kosher, it doesn't work that way. The majority, we follow the majority. Trish and Audrey, please. This feels like a really different God from the one we saw in Job. I mean, where was Elijah when Job was wondering, what's God thinking? I mean, this God is like, put things in motion. I'm on the sidelines. You take the ball and run with it. Yep. Um, and it's not, you know, the, the, the is not perspective. A, yeah. In both the, the Robert Goldenberg essay in Back to the Sources and in the Steinsaltz book, which I've enjoyed going back through uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, both clarify that the Talmud is not a work of theology. God is a, actually God is a bit player in the Talmud. Not an extra exactly, but if you read the whole Talmud, and please know I have not read the whole Talmud. I've read just such a minuscule fraction of Talmud in my, in my rabbinical career of 23 years. Um, God is not the central figure. The rabbinic community is. And that's really important. That comes through loud and clear in this text. And yet, if you read it, as it were, cover to cover, you get a lot about the rabbinic views of God. And I say views, plural, because internal consistency does not seem to be an overriding editorial concern of the Talmud, um, which echoes anachronistically one of my favorite lines by the great American transcendentalist, author and philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who once wrote, adherence to a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. It's one of my all-time favorite lines. I, I should really frame that one and put it somewhere because, you know, it's nothing to apologize for, that there will be times when the God that emerges in the rabbinic uh, literature of the Talmud specifically is more like the, the strict judge or the miracle worker. But in this case, at least, I think, Trish, you're exactly right. How different this God is from the way God appears even in the scripture. Um, I mean, Job is a particularly um, narrow window into one view of God, but this is very much a God who is not pulling the strings. A God who is not only on the sidelines, but content about it, happy about it. Saying, yes, this is the way I intended it to be. This is why I gave you the Torah in the first place. I didn't give you the Torah so that you could keep calling me and saying, uh, God, what am I supposed to do now? I gave you the Torah so that you can figure it out. It's really, I, I just, you know, you can, you, I hope you can see just from my, my facial expressions how much I, I, I am moved by this passage, not just intellectually, but emotionally. Audrey, please. And then we'll wrap up for today. I was just going to say that then, God is not the God of the first five books. Forget Job. What about the first five books? And that's, that can lead to a lot of other things down the road. Uh, I, I can't disagree with that. And, and I, you know, so one of the questions that I think the Talmud invites us to ask in a serious and sustained way is not so much who is God, but who are we? And when I say we, I mean, we, the Jewish people. Like, who are but we and what are we here for? And what's our relationship with God? And one, I think, can reasonably argue, we are rabbinic Jews. Most of what we do, most of what we, I hate the word believe, but most of what we practice is directly conveyed to us through the rabbinic literature. And the Bible, as much as the rabbis pay fealty to them, it's more than lip service. They, they obviously stand in awe of the Bible. They, they treat it. They regard it as the living word of God. Yeah. 
Which but is- not the literal word of God. And I think that it is, there are, are consistently inconsistencies between a theology of the biblical God and a composite theology of the God as God appears in the rabbinic literature. At some point, it's, it may not be fundamentally incompatible to hold both of these um, notions of God, the biblical God, even the biblical God is internally inconsistent, by the way, because the Bible is the work of many people. The, the, The Bible is not written by God. The Bible is a record of thousands of years of Jewish or Israelite people commenting on the relationship between humanity and God and between the Jewish people and God. And it's not internally consistent, but it's really not consistent with what the rabbis have to say about God at times. But I think we hold all of that as Jews today, I think is an extraordinary uh, demand on one's ability to contain divergent notions, even about something as consequential as the creator of the universe in one single mind. But that also gives rise to a kernel of uh, free will and the concept. Yeah. And, you know, a a Jew, in my view, increasingly, a Jew is not what a Jew believes. A Jew is what a Jew does and how a Jew lives. Right. So on that note, I can think of no more fitting way to conclude for today. Thank you for this deep dive into Talmud. Um, The session has been recorded. Happy New Year, and we meet again on the 19th, the week from today at 1015. Kola kavod, Rabbi. Kola kavod, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.